Tonight on KQED Newsroom, did skin color make a difference in the police response to the insurrection in D.C.? The newly minted district attorney of Los Angeles, George Gascon, says absolutely yes. And he gives us his strategy for a more equitable criminal justice system. And the vaccine is finally here, but distribution has been slow. A new strain of the virus has been detected, and we're on the verge of another tidal wave of infections in California. Plus, we round up the week's big political stories, from calls for the impeachment of President Trump to a recall effort against Governor Newsom. Last, we listen to something musical, with a California band's version of Georgia On My Mind. Georgia on Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. The extremist attack on the nation's capital this week highlighted the role of race in policing. Our first guest shares his perspective on what happened in D.C. He's a prosecutor taking aim at who gets criminalized and why. As the new district attorney of Los Angeles, he says it's time to undo what he calls decades of racist hyper-incarceration. George Gascon, a former police officer who served as San Francisco's district attorney for nearly a decade, took office in Los Angeles one month ago and has already implemented broad changes. He will not seek the death penalty in the future and is ending the use of cash bail for most non-serious and non-violent cases. He also wants to drop sentencing enhancements, all in the pursuit of decreasing systemic racism. Mr. Gascon is facing significant opposition to his policy changes. Joining me now by Skype is Los Angeles County District Attorney George Gascon. DA Gascon, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. On the day of the attempted takeover, you tweeted that the police seem to have lost their handcuffs. What did you mean by that? Yeah, you know, what I meant is that this was an event that was planned. There was a lot of evidence that this was going to happen. We had the, the president inviting people to come. They certain there was not an issue of intelligence here. This was public knowledge. Um, and we saw Capitol Police being not only completely unprepared, uh, but when people started to show up, the treatment and the way that they were almost allowing people to get through, it was a contrast to what we saw, for instance, in June of last year, when we had Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrating in the Capitol, mostly peaceful people. We had four, four, nearly 400 arrests. We, had, we saw a tremendous show of force. Um, there was, you know, the, 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 the evidence of racism in our system continues to flow, and it was so evident in what occurred this week. You know, it's almost like, okay, these are white people, so therefore they're not dangerous. And obviously, we know that the contrary is the case. We saw the destruction. We saw the fact that five people die, including a police officer. You talk about a two-tier system and that we saw that play out in the Capitol this week. How have you seen that play out in California during your years as district attorney? Look, it's, it's continuous. All you have to do is you look at the uh, the number of people that get arrested. You know, always African Americans are disproportionately arrested, disproportionately prosecuted, disproportionately end up in our jails and prisons. Uh, and it really doesn't matter where, whether it's San Francisco or L.A. or anywhere else in the state. Uh, it's an area that you continue to see the evidence of systemic racism impacting the work that we do. And that is why we need to start thinking about reimagining our system. You are talking about a fundamental transformation of the criminal justice system in California. What do you see is fundamentally broken that needs to be fixed? Well, I think, you know, first of all, I, I would almost say, I used to say the system was broken, and I've come to the conclusion it's not necessarily broken. It's doing what it was intended to do. It was a very racist system that is, you know, having the outcome that it was uh, in a way designed to do, which is incarcerate a lot of black and brown people. Mm. What needs to happen is we really need to reimagine the way that we achieve community safety. We need to use data, we need to use science, and we need to re, uh, the, reduce our reliance on incarceration and punishment, which clearly hasn't worked for us. Well, you're not alone. You are part of a wave of progressive DAs, although you, you started that work while you were here in San Francisco as district attorney for nine years. Uh, but there have been many others who have come on to the scene who also feel similarly. You're also fighting a lot of pushback when it comes to this sort of softer approach to criminal justice. What do you think is the biggest concern for your critics out there? Yeah, and, and I just want to point out, it's not necessarily softer, it's smarter, right? What we have been doing for so many years, our recidivism rates are extremely high. In fact, a lot of the insecurity that we continue to have 
is a result of over incarceration and over punishment. You know, if if punishment was the currency of safety, we would be the safest nation in the world. Uh, the problem is, you know, to the point of your earlier question, you know, the pushback that I'm getting from some people in my office and around us, look, we have a system that has been addicted to high levels of incarceration and punishment. We have created an industry. There is both monetary and political interest in this. And any time that you challenge a status quo, you're going to get a pushback. And that is what is occurring. Many people in my office are supporting what I'm doing, but obviously there are some people that are not, and that's going to be an evolution. You often note that your thoughts on criminal justice evolve and that you're not the same district attorney who first took office here in San Francisco many years ago. What's been the most significant shift in how you view our system of crime and punishment? Yeah, you know, when I became the district attorney, I already had a clear focus in reducing incarceration, and that was really a major component of why I became the district attorney. But I never really looked at it as a system needing to be completely reimagined. In fact, I used to use the word, the system is broken and needs to be fixed, much hmm. like the question you asked earlier. It's just in my own evolution, I came to the conclusion that the system really isn't broken. The system was designed to do what it's doing, and it's doing it extremely well. It's incarcerated a lot of people, incarcerated a lot of black people. So we need to start rethinking the way that we achieve community safety and community well-being. And, and quite frankly, community health. And what are those changes? How should we be looking at these issues? Yeah, I think that first of all, we need to start invoking science. We need, there's a lot of science that it tells us about the impacts of incarceration. When does it work? When it doesn't work? The impact of punishment. We need to start reducing our addiction to incarceration, punishment, and we need to start shifting into uh, education. We need to use more uh, public health approaches to our work. We need to be more thoughtful about the interventions that we provide. We need to start reallocating funding from the criminal justice system into other verticals like public health and education that are more likely to create sustainable and more healthier communities. And is that possible? Is there the funding and the infrastructure in place for that to happen? Are you finding those changes are actually making a difference? No, absolutely it's possible. Look, I mean, it's, it, it's mostly a matter of reallocating resources and reallocating of, of uh, priorities. If we start reducing our prison population as we have, you know, prison is one of the most expensive components of the system. Prosecution, jail, policing. It's a matter of reallocating resources and reallocating attention. We've already seen some of that already happening in LA County. There was a voter approved measure, Measure J, that is starting to take some funding away from, from the law enforcement side of the equation and put it into public health and uh, education. We defunded public health and education about 30 years ago. You know, we built 22 prisons in California, one public university in the last three decades. Hmm. We need to start going back and, 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 and allocating our resources in a different way. Well, you've hit the ground running there in Los Angeles, issuing a special directive with major changes to the system as soon as you took office last month. And as you mentioned, it's already stirred a backlash. The union for your deputy DAs has filed suit against that directive. Are you willing to make compromises on some of the changes you're looking for, such as sentencing enhancements or the three strikes regulations, in order to work more effectively with your prosecutors? Well, look, I mean, as I, the, the, I said from the very beginning that this will be a, a, an evolution, and there are certainly we've already made some adjustments that we'll need to make adjustments, but I am not going to compromise on the principles. There are parts of our procedures that we need to continue to evaluate as we are, in, you know, operate, putting into operation, implementing these orders, but the principles that we need to reduce mass incarceration, the principles that we have to go after systemic racism, that is not an area that I'm willing to compromise because that is the very essence of why over two million people voted for me and that's the very essence of why I'm the district attorney in LA. So what does that mean? Which specific uh, of changes would you say these, these cannot go, these will not change? Well, I think the area of you know holding the system accountable, police officers, prosecutors accountable, especially around the areas that are impacted by racism, we're not gonna compromise in that area. The, the overall concept of reducing mass incarceration is not an area that we're going to compromise. The area of not exercising the death penalty, the area of dealing with juveniles in a very different way. The reimagining of the system is real and is something that I'm very committed to. And the outcomes have to be one that are different from what we have today. Will you be more aggressively going after law enforcement officers who have been involved in excessive use of force cases? 
Well, look, we were very aggressive in San Francisco. The laws were a little different. We now have new laws that actually was the only district attorney that supported those laws. So there are unquestionably cases in L.A. County that the former DA, uh, we believe, gave a pass on. Some of those we're going to look at it again. And moving forward, we're working to create a special prosecutor for some of those cases. I'm going to continue to work at the state level and legislation to continue to ensure that good policing is rewarded, but bad policing is held accountable. All right. And in the last few moments here, you have not yet made major personnel changes. Do you expect to do that in the coming weeks or months in order to have people that you're working with on your team whose ideas sync with yours? You know, we're, we're looking at a first phase of uh, the reorganization of the office will be announced later this month. There, there are differences in our office when compared to even San Francisco or many other places. L.A. is a very heavy heavily protected civil service process where you have to deal with a, a lot of restrictions about how you move people, how you hire people, how you promote people. So obviously that creates uh, different challenges, but nevertheless, uh, we are moving forward with a, a process of reorganization and a management analysis, and we'll continue to move forward with that. LA County District Attorney George Gascon, thank you for your time. My pleasure, Priya. Thank you. And now for an update on the pandemic. Coronavirus numbers keep climbing in California. There were more than 50,000 new infections Thursday alone, while the death toll has now climbed above 28,000 statewide. We've been getting reports about ambulances circling hospitals for hours, looking for space for critically ill patients. Healthcare workers say they're exhausted. One LA County supervisor called the situation a human disaster, and it's only expected to grow more dire. Meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of doses of the new COVID-19 vaccine have been stuck in warehouses or in transit. Governor Newsom acknowledged this week that the state needs to do better. Joining me now by Skype from Palo Alto is Dr. Yvonne Maldonado, an epidemiologist and vaccine expert at Stanford University. Dr. Maldonado, thanks for joining us. You are in the field right now. Tell us about where you are and what's going on around you. Uh, yes, right now I am in our outpatient treatment tent uh, here on the Stanford campus seeing patients. And this has been set up due to the virus. Uh, tell us about the sort of activity that's happening there. Yeah, so back in March when we developed at Stanford our own uh, diagnostic PCR test that was approved by the FDA for emergency use, we develop these several tents for people to come in and be able to drive through and get tested. Um, we were able to take a couple of the tents, they're very large as you probably can tell, um, and we made them into outpatient treatment centers for therapeutic trials because uh, they're safer here for our other patients. That is that we can bring our COVID positive patients here and keep them away from the main hospital. So we've been running uh, trials here for several months now. As you know, the numbers have been going up and we're hearing this morning that we should be expecting another 15,000 hospitalizations in California in the next 10 days. The California Hospital Association said it's like standing on a beach and watching the tsunami approach. Is that your sense as well? And what are you concerned about over the next week or two weeks? Well, frankly, I saw, and this was ex my exact words, uh, I saw a tsunami coming back in October and November. Um, and I think we've been very prepared here at Stanford. I think the state has been warning people. I think the one group that has not uh, perceived the tsunami are the numbers of people out there who just don't believe that this is real, that won't wear a mask and that won't uh, distance. Um, I think healthcare providers are all quite aware of what's going on. So yes, um, we are seeing a little bit of a leveling off today, but we don't know what will happen in the next few days. And even if it levels off, we're leveling off at record high levels. So it's not great news here. Um, this should not be the new normal. <laughs> You're on the advisory committee that's working with the CDC on the vaccine rollout. Tell me about your evaluation of vaccine distribution in the state so far. Yeah, so the vaccine distribution is really unfortunately not part of what we're doing with the CDC ACIP committee, for which I'm a liaison. The distribution is very, um, it's, it's not a uh, uniform approach. So for example, it happens at the, the federal level 
is where the vaccines are allocated to the states. Each state makes its own decision and within the states, different local uh, or county health departments can make their own decisions around allocation. So it's really a patchwork allocation scheme. Um, and uh, that's just the way our healthcare system works in the United States and our public health system works. There's also been a slowdown in the distribution of vaccines throughout California due to logistical constraints, uh, such as keeping the vaccine cold and transporting it. Can you tell us how that's playing out there? Yeah, well, fortunately for us here at Stanford, we've been doing, a, I think, a great job because we obviously, as a, uh, you know, at a, as a tertiary care, quaternary care academic medical center, we have all of those resources. So we've been able to manage the transport, the storage, the handling and the distribution quite well. But even that um, is an operational challenge because we have never had to do this before. So you're layering on a, and developing a brand new uh, operational system on, on top of existing systems while you're dealing with a surge of patients coming into the hospital. And by the way, many of those are not COVID patients either. We're talking about our regular um, uh, uh, patient care responsibilities. So. It is, uh, it's not optimal. I think we're doing a good job, all things considered, but some areas just do not have the resources that a place like Stanford might have. Should the state be bringing in more people to help administer the vaccine? For example, there are these thousands of qualified and available nursing students. Should they be getting in to help? You know, I, I don't want to, you know, comment on what the state should or shouldn't do because I really don't know what the needs are. I do think that a rapid needs assessment. That is, what is the what are the challenges that each each uh, county, each local area is facing, and how do you respond to those needs? The needs may be different in different places. So, for example, if you're in a rural area where there's a low density population and you need to get out to that last mile, um, you may not need more vaccinators. You may just need a way to have people drive out and get vaccine to people. I've worked in developing countries where we've given vaccine to people who live in areas that have not even been put on the map. So, uh, but those systems have developed over many, many years. It's very hard to do that really rapidly. Um, I think uh, we just aren't used to dealing with a crisis like this here in the in the first world, uh, but getting a sense of what's, what are the needs locally and addressing those is, should be done very rapidly at the state level, I think. Could you tell me about the second doses, how those are rolling out and if those seem to be needed or if they'll be used to stretch the vaccine supply? Yeah, the question about a second dose uh, re remains to be resolved. At this time, the way the clinical trials were set up, they were very well set up, but they were set up to answer a specific question. That is, do two doses work compared to no doses? And we really, um, I think at this time, should be rolling out second doses as quickly as we can because we don't understand whether you need that second dose to boost the immunity that you get from the first dose. So what our concern is that the first dose may give you partial immunity or may give you immunity that doesn't really last very long. So in effect, uh, if you miss out on that second dose or if you wait too long for that second dose, it's possible, although we don't know, that uh, it may be like uh, uh, giving short term or no immunity at all. So we need to get better uh, information about that before we really start thinking about deferring or, or, or uh, canceling second doses altogether. Could you tell me more about this new virus variant that's been found and how you expect that to impact cases both regionally and globally? Yeah, so there are a number of variants and we know that these viruses will mutate, I think. Uh, I think what's important about what we, we're seeing now is these variants are succumbing to what we call selective pressure. So as the immune response, as people get infected and there's an immune response, um, the viruses that don't, get, don't infect you are the ones that succumb to the immune system. But as viruses mutate, you might see one or two viruses that survive because they've been able to escape immunity or that just by chance were able to replicate. Um, and the concern will be that over time, there could be a, an accumulation of these variants. So far, uh, they don't seem to be a more um, virulent. That is, they don't seem to cause more disease. But there are some decent indications now that they could be more infectious. That is, they may be able to infect the human cells a little better than the, the uh, pre-variant strains. So we do need to keep an eye on them, but really, 
we need to focus on the basics again. That is masking, distancing, hand hygiene, uh, cleaning, keeping all of those uh, guidelines in place will at least keep us uh, still free from infection with those variants at this time. And by the way, the CDC just issued um, uh, a study uh, in the last couple of days showing that most transmission will be coming from asymptomatic individuals. So, you know, everybody needs to mask and, and distance because the person who says they feel fine may actually have a pretty decent chance of being infected and giving that to you. Dr. Yvonne Maldonado with Stanford University Health System, we very much appreciate your time. Thank you for um, uh, making this a, an issue that everyone should hear. Unprecedented, unrivaled, unmatched and unparalleled, the nation watched horrified as armed extremists stormed the Capitol this week. In other political news, the Democrats won control of the Senate the very same day. And in California, the effort to recall Governor Newsom is growing amid vaccine distribution delays. Joining us now by Skype to sort through the political news of the week are two members of KQED's stellar politics and government team, Scott Schaefer and Marisa Lagos, both in San Francisco. Marisa, let's start with the mob that descended on the Capitol this week. What went through your mind as you were watching? You know, Priya, I was shocked, but not surprised. This is the culmination of four years of lies from President Trump, uh, demonizing the opposition party, of outright falsehoods about this election. Um, I think that it was a scary moment because it was an attack on our democracy and we should treat it as such. And I think it continues to raise those questions we've all been asking about the way black and brown people are treated differently than white people are when it comes to policing and security. And Scott, what about you? You've been working in politics or reporting on politics for quite a while now. Uh, did it feel surprising to you? You know, as Marisa said, it was uh, shocking, but not surprising, given the rhetoric of the president and everything that's really transpired since Charlottesville, since President Trump's inaugural address, where he talked about an American carnage. But as a human being, it was infuriating to see the nation's capital desecrated and trashed the way that it was. We're, we're journalists, but we're also people and Americans. And I found it to be really just, you know, infuriating. Marisa, President Trump's still in power for about two more weeks, and it sounds like Democrats want to impeach him again. And much of that charge is being led by some of California's elected leaders. Is this going to be largely symbolic? Uh, maybe. I mean, you know, an impeachment, if it was actually sustained in the Senate, could prevent him from running again. Um, but I think that it is important even if it is just symbolic, Priya, that we make those symbolic acts right now. Because as we said, these are people who are trying to undermine the democratic will of the American people. And I think that that is not something you get a pass on just because you only have 12 days left in office. And Marisa, we're hearing that Trump may be looking at pardoning himself. Is that possible? It's really untested. I mean, he could try it. It would go to court, I'm sure. It also wouldn't resolve his problems in the states like New York, where he's being investigated for tax uh, fraud and other issues. So I don't think that that would solve his legal problems. And from what we hear from people around him is that's really setting in that reality that he is no longer going to have the privilege of executive uh, protection in a couple weeks. Mm. Scott, you were looking at the role California played in the Georgia race, which was so important in the Senate, which split the Senate and gives Vice President-elect Kamala Harris the deciding vote. What did you see when it comes to California's involvement with Georgia? Well, just in the relative short term, I mean, Californians fueled the campaigns of John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock with more than you know tens of millions of dollars uh, in the past several weeks. I mean, it's been extraordinary. There have also been volunteers that have gone to uh, Georgia to help out. Uh, but really, you know, Maurice and I spoke uh, yesterday with Steve Phillips, who is a longtime activist in the Bay Area, and he's been working with Stacey Abrams back in Georgia for a decade. Uh, she had a plan to make this happen. It did not happen overnight. Uh, and uh, there was, it was Californians like Steve Phillips and Amy Allison with She the People uh, working very closely with Amy, uh, Stacey Abrams and others to make this happen. It, it really is a, uh, a testament, I think, to long-term planning and focus. Marisa, what's the latest on the Newsom recall effort? And then also, if you'd talk a little bit about the competition that's shaping up for the governorship um, with, say, San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner. Yeah, so we do know that um, folks who would like to recall Newsom have until March to get their signatures, the millions of signatures they need. They say they're getting closer. They got an infusion of about $500,000 this week from a wealthy Orange County man who has opposed uh, Newsom's 
restrictions on churches during COVID. Faulkner did launch this exploratory committee. He's long been expected to challenge Newsom in 22. I think the question for Republicans, if they can get this on the ballot, do they have the organization and time to actually mount a real challenge to this governor? And Scott, last, we actually had some good news come out of the California budget today. Tell us about that. Yeah, the governor unveiled a $227 billion spending plan, actually larger uh, than was expected by quite a bit. There were uh, a, quite a large windfall from uh, income taxes paid by the wealthiest Californians who have done quite well during the pandemic. Uh, there's going to be more money put into the rainy day fund to replenish that, uh, more money for K through 12 education as well as higher education, vaccine distribution, immediate help for small businesses and individuals hurt by the recession. So all in all, California actually uh, had a lot to be, I think, uh, pleased by and, and proud of, given uh, how many people are struggling and how many states are really, uh, you know, facing really large deficits. Scott Schaefer and Marisa Lagos, both with KQED's politics team. We thank you so much for your insight and your time. We've got another couple busy weeks until the inauguration, and then I'm sure continuing from there. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. This week, we're featuring a band as part of our Something Beautiful series. The Los Angeles-based Las Cafeteras dedicated a song to promote voter turnout in Georgia's closely watched Senate race. It's their version of Ray Charles' classic, Georgia On My Mind, sung in both Spanish and English. I'm Priya David Clemens. You can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens, and you can find more of our news coverage at kqed.org slash kqednewsroom. From all of us here at KQED Newsroom, thank you for joining us. Good night.